on the virtual Bible study tonight. We want to talk about miracles. We're going to talk about miracles with the specific emphasis about are we able to do them today? Can men perform miracles today is the question we're asking. We're going to seek a Bible answer. All right. We're going to look forward to that discussion. We're going to get started right now. It's time for this week's edition of the Virtual Bible Study. The Virtual Bible Study is a live, internet-only call-in program dedicated to the honest study and discussion of God's Word. Do you have a question about something in the Bible? Or are you simply interested in learning more about the Scriptures? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned tonight as we look into the pages of God's Word. The Virtual Bible Study is brought to you this time each week by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can participate in the discussion tonight by calling 93 one three eight one four five six seven or by emailing your questions or comments from collegeview.com we hope you'll take out your bibles and study along with us as we begin an exciting study of god's word on this edition of the virtual bible study and we welcome you to the virtual bible study this is the virtual bible study for thursday august 8th 2019 thank you for joining us on the program tonight my name is jacob Gwynn. my father greg Gwynn is here hello dad jacob great to see you tonight glad to be with you tonight and uh, kyle's behind the controls again kyle welcome it's good to be here. glad that you're here and uh, we're glad that you're here on the other end of the line whether you be listening listening to us live, listening to us in the podcast, or watching us in our archived video feed on YouTube. We're glad that you're here, and we want your comments at any time, especially if you're live, but anytime. Questions at collegeview.com, 877-381-4567, and if you're watching us live tonight in the chat room. So we have still bumper stickers to give away. Uh, we'd love to get one on the, your back of your car. Uh, Send us uh, an email to questions at collegeview.com and give us your snail mail or U.S. Postal Service address so we can stick a bumper sticker in the mail to you. We'd like to get that going. Uh, we'd also like you to promote the virtual Bible study uh, uh, on your Facebook page. You can, you know, because we, we're on Facebook. That's all the Facebook I do is virtual Bible study yeah. and the church here. I, I don't do any personal uh, Facebooking, but uh, we try to get some advertising done. And if you look up the virtual Bible study on Facebook and then like our page, uh, that gets us a little uh, extra exposure. So you can do that for us too. Or just tell a friend. Even if you yeah. don't, maybe you don't, you listen to us and you disagree with what we say, you might tell a friend, hey, say, come here and, and uh, let's, let's study with these guys and talk with them about the scriptures on yeah. the virtual Bible study. So uh, we want to hear from you uh, and help us spread the word. All right. So tonight, we have a question or a topic that was suggested at the close of our program last uh, week. As we always say, if you have a suggestion for a future edition of the Virtual Bible Study, we welcome those suggestions. And so a listener suggested last night, or last Thursday night, hey, why don't you guys talk about miracles? Do they still occur today? And we thought it was a good topic. Uh, and so we wanted to talk about it tonight. Yeah, it's not a new topic. Uh, uh, we've covered it before on the Virtual Bible Study, but it's been a little while back. In fact, I, I was looking through our archives, Jacob, and really early, early on, uh, we did a program on miracles. And uh, <clears throat> and I, I, I found, I think, four different programs over the years that we've dealt, tried to deal with a very similar question, the one we're asking tonight. But this is a subject that comes up a lot. And I think it's certainly worthy of our investigation. Uh, definitely people differ on this question. And there are people in the religious world, uh, those who would call themselves Christians, uh, who believe adamantly that miracles are still being performed, that, that they personally maybe have performed miracles or that they have witnessed miracles occurring. And so uh, they, they have a strong feeling about that. You're gonna, uh, we might as well go ahead and expose where we're coming from on the answer to this question. We do not think that men today are empowered by the Holy Spirit to work miracles. Right. Uh, and so, obviously, there's a difference there. And But we don't shy away from differences on the virtual Bible study, and, and we want to investigate this. Absolutely. And, and so, again, as you said, if you disagree with us... Uh, Please, first of all, study with us tonight and see where we're coming from. Consider what we say and compare it to the Scriptures. And then if, if, you know, if, if more study is merited, if you'd like to, to join us in person or get your preacher to join us in person, we'd, we'd be glad to study that way too. Uh, just let us know. But let's, let's and we're not putting ourselves forward as, as like flawless or you know, perfect. Super authorities on all questions. We're not the Pope. Well, he's not the super authority either, but we're 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 open to discussing things. And if you think we've got it uh, got it wrong, we, we'd like to hear from you or 
your preacher or someone else you think would, uh, yeah, would yeah. talk to us about this. Okay. Yeah. All right. So earlier today to our update list, we sent out the questions that we want to try to cover on the program tonight. We always remind you, get on our update list. If you're not, send us an email to questions at collegeview.com and say, add me to the list. Remember, College View spelled funny, C-O-L-L-E-G-E-V-U-E, collegeview.com questions at collegeview.com. Here are the questions we sent out earlier today. Number one, what is the proper biblical definition of a miracle? We'll talk about that first, and I think that's really an important thing to, to get a handle on. Number two, did the miracles recorded in the New Testament really happen? Mm -hmm. If so, what was their purpose? Okay. Number three, has the purpose of miracles been fulfilled? Number four, how did people receive miraculous gifts in the first century? Are those means still available to us today? And number five, does the Bible discuss the end of miraculous gifts? Okay. So you want to start off with the definition of a miracle. I, mean, I guess you've you got to define terms if you're going to have any kind of fruitful discussion. What are we talking about here? I, I think that's right. And Donna is down in Florida, I believe. Donna says uh, that she... Google the big biblical definition of a miracle. It stated that a miracle is an event not explicable by natural or scientific laws. Such an event may be attributed to a supernatural being, especially a deity, magic, a miracle worker, a saint, or a religious leader. Yeah, uh, it might. Yeah, it, uh, I would not doubt that that is exactly the kind of definition that you would find if you looked it up in a dictionary or Googled it uh, for an answer. Uh, mainly, I would agree with that, but we notice we specifically ask what's the proper biblical definition of a miracle, and so I would have to scratch out magic. It's not magic, you know. Magic is magic, uh, and and a magician can make things look really amazing. Uh, you, you watch some of those magicians. I saw and you, cut somebody in two. You're just stunned by what yep. they're. But there's a fully natural explanation of what okay. they're doing, yeah. and, he, and he could teach you if he would. Most magicians won't tell you how they do their tricks, but a if trick. he would, if he would, he could tell you how he did it, and everything he did was fully in compliance with natural scientific law. Oh. There wasn't, uh, and and oh, so right. I, in this definition that Donna sent, I would have to scratch out magic. A miracle is not a magic trick. Oh, you know what, though? A lot of religious people are... are performing miracles when they're there really are, just performing there magic are people, tricks. There are people, and they, it's been documented. Different different uh, ex exposés, if you okay. will, have been done. Documentaries have been filmed showing that some of the people, I'm not, I'm not saying everybody, uh, I think there are some sincere people involved in this sort of thing, but there are some real charlatans out there yeah, saw, who are playing tricks. I saw a video recently of where the, the, they were lengthening people's legs. Have you ever seen that one in person where they lengthened somebody's uh, legs? Uh, well, they, they showed the, they showed how they did that, you know, that they, they could really trick people into thinking that even the people who were, they were doing it to, that their leg was getting longer. Yeah. Uh, but it's there's a lot of that kind of stuff that's going yeah. on. People are cl claiming that are miracles. Yeah, and so that, in regards to the definition of Donaldson, that, that would be my one quibble with that. All right, so Chloe is in Chapel Hill, Tennessee tonight, and she uh, sent in an act of God superseding or suspending natural law. I like that. I think that is a good definition. Um, yeah. it, 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 so natural law is suspended or superseded. Uh, it's something that you cannot describe by, by any natural explanation. For instance, I, 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 Jesus walking on water. When, when a person goes out into the water, they don't walk across the top of it. They sink down in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the, the, it would have to be something different than what n is typically natural for Jesus to walk on the water. That's a miracle. That's, 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 that's superseding or suspending natural law. Well, that's along the lines of what Lou in Minnesota said. He said, I would venture to say an event that can't be explained by science or nature that has been done by God for the glory of God. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lou, for that. And cancel on the same lines. He says a miracle is an act or an action that transcends natural law. So we're all saying the same thing in a little bit different ways and helping us get a, a better understanding of terms here. And Angela's down in Lake Park, Georgia tonight, and she says miracles were gifts that allowed the first century Christians who received them to do things they couldn't do otherwise, uh, healing the sick, raising the dead, speaking in languages they didn't know before, et cetera, in order to prove the truth of their message. Today, people call uh, people like to call the life-saving that don't, doctors do miracles, but miracles in the New Testament were all performed 
without the help or use of tools. So she That's got another my, angle on this. Well, this is an important point it that Angela good. brings out. Um, you, the word miracle is used very loosely in our world today. Uh, and, and a perfect example of that is when a baby is born. And so you're holding this newborn baby in your hands and someone said, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Well, I'll tell you, it's a really wonderful, amazing, awesome thing. But it's not a miracle mm -hmm. because the, that baby being born, it, it was all according to natural law. And the natural laws are understood. They're explained. They're documented. Uh, and so it's not a miracle. Now, there was once when a baby was born, and it was a miracle, and that was the case of Jesus and the virgin birth of Jesus. But with the exception of that, every other birth that has ever occurred has been by natural law. And so we, I, I think this is really important because I, I have uh, I've had discussions with people in the past where I think that they, they make that, that they confuse that, that they talk about wonderful things that happen. Uh, you know, I, I had a guy not too long ago tell me that he was just broke, dead broke on money, just couldn't make his bills. And suddenly some money showed up in the mail. Someone sent him some money. And and it was sort of the, the, the people who sent it had sort of mixed up their records and they sent him some money that he that they weren't really had not committed to him. He contacted him and said, oh, go ahead and keep the money. And he said, that's a miracle. <laughs> you know, so So the people's bookkeeping error on the other end resulted in him receiving some money that he had not expected to receive. He called it a miracle. It wasn't a miracle. Now, I would argue that that may well have been providential. And that's a whole different thing. And we've done programs on God's providence where God makes things uh, available to us. Uh, things happen uh, that benefit us. God answers prayers and, and brings to pass his will. But we do not believe that today he suspends natural law, or at least he doesn't empower men to suspend natural law in order to accomplish these ends. And so that's really important to get that definition down. Uh, yeah, and, you know, uh, well, also, I guess we should clarify so, some of the, the mir things that, uh, that Angela listed here, very definitive, very easy to see. Um, but the what people are calling miracles today, even the religious people, you know, somebody has a headache. And they they slap them on the forehead, and now they're they're supposedly healed, or maybe well, they have double vision. Well, I've been to, poor. Uh, I have personally been to a number of uh, faith healing rallies where where individuals were claiming the power to work miracles, especially miracles of healing, and it, it was always very obvious that the kind of things that they were healing were things that you couldn't verify. Uh, for instance, hearing loss. You, well, if a person has hearing loss, and that's a real problem, I understand, but I can't see hearing loss beforehand, and I can't see it after it supposedly is gone. I can't verify. It's not visually verifiable. There's no real proof there that it happened or didn't happen. And, and, and contrast that dramatically with the kind of things that Jesus did. He healed lepers. Leprosy was un, uncurable. It is to this day. There's some treatments for it today, but effectively still to this day an uncurable disease. Jesus healed people instantly. Lame that couldn't walk. Lame again. never had walked. For instance, in Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John were coming into the temple, there was a man who laid there at the gate of the temple who had never walked in his whole life. And he jumped up. And he was well known. He, 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 was a, he was an individual well known, and that was his spot. That's where he begged, and that's how people... With such infirmities, that's how they sustained life, was by the, by the gifts that people would give them, the handouts, the charity. And so everybody knew this was the guy. This was the guy who was always there at that beautiful gate of the temple. That gate was called the beautiful gate. And as you said, he leaped up and walked and ran instantly. He, he had never walked in his whole life, and suddenly he, he, he's running and leaping. No physical therapy required. No physical therapy required. Yep. Those are the kind of things that, uh, that are the miracles that we describe in the New Testament. All right. So now we've defined terms, and we've about used up our, our allotted time here for the first segment. But uh, it's very good to know what the biblical definition of a miracle is. Contrast that with what people are calling miracles today. Even so-called religious faith healers are calling miracles today. And we see a, a stark contrast. When we get back, where is the discussion going next? Okay. When we get back... We want to talk about whether we really believe that miracles did occur in the Bible. There's some people who don't. 
maybe we've all been duped and none of it ever happened. Oh, okay. Well, let's talk about that when we get back and we'll take your comments. Sign in the chat room and share your comments with other listeners. Send us an email. Give us a call. Don't go anywhere. We're back right after this. Have you checked out all of the resources on collegeview.com lately? Check it out now while you listen to these important messages. The virtual Bible study will be right back after this. Tonight on Channel 8 WSIN, it's TV like you've never seen it before. Starting at 8, it's TV's funniest new comedy, Fornication in the City, and Marie has been misbehaving again. Guess what? I just cheated on my husband. He doesn't even know about it. <laughs> And then at 8.30, it's the show that's setting the standard. You won't want to miss this week's I Love This World, where Bob makes a great announcement. Well, I think it's time you knew the truth. I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> and at 9 o'clock, it's the show that Television Magazine has called the number one drama for murder and violence. You won't want to miss this week's In Cold Blood to see who will be the next to be gunned down. It all starts tonight at 8 o'clock on Channel 8 WSIN. I'm Greg Gwynn reminding you that sin is a terrible thing and that those who are entertained by watching others sin fall under the condemnation of God that is mentioned in Romans 128. Be careful what you watch on television because in spite of what the devil wants you to think, sin is always sin and it's never funny. Here's some quotes worth pondering. The person who rows the boat usually doesn't have time to rock it. When fishing for men... There's no closed season. The chains of habit often cannot be felt until they're too strong to break. Either you master your habits or they will master you. Man, wish I'd said that. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Colossians 3, 17. Now, back to the program. We're back on the program as we talk about miracles, and uh, we compare them with what the Scriptures teach. Uh, listener in the chat room tonight says, Seems many people today want to ascribe something wonderful and joyous to a miracle if a man comes out of a coma after several years. That's a good thing. It's not a miracle, though. I think that's right. Okay. I think that's right. Okay. So and, it, uh, and we're not even saying it's not a blessing from God. It, it certainly can be a blessing from God, and it can be a wonderful thing, but it does not, uh, it does meet, not the meet the definition of miracle. And it's... And it's very important to make that distinction because wonderful thing. A, an atheist might experience a, a wonderful event in his life. You know, uh, I, I'm sure two atheists could marry and have children, and they're blessed by that. But it's, they haven't performed a miracle. Well, and the other thing is, someone will say, "Well, if, if you're saying that miracles don't occur today, well, why would you even pray? You know, somebody's sick. They got the, they're real sick. They might die, and you're praying that they would get better. Why would you pray that if you don't believe miracles occur today?" Well, that's a deeper question, too, but we believe that God answers prayers. In, in other words, the miraculous is not the only way God works in the okay. world right. or has worked or ever did work. Yeah. The miraculous is not God's only working mechanism. Okay, so you still believe God works today? I do. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Okay. All right. Let's be clear about that. All right. Number two. All right. So do you believe that the miracles of the New Testament really happened? And then, if, if so, what was their purpose? Let's, let's do the first part first. Do you believe they happened? Can I just go on record and say, uh, adamantly affirm, yes, that I believe every miracle recorded in the Bible actually happened and happened just as they are recorded. And it, it wasn't trickery. It wasn't sleight of hand. It wasn't someone pulling a magic uh, rabbit out of a hat. It was a real, legitimate Act which superseded or suspended, as Chloe said, natural law. Did not have a natural explanation. Could not be explained in any way by, by natural means. The only way you could explain it was that natural law was broken. God did something supernatural. Exactly right. Donna agrees with that. I believe the Bible is a factual is factual in its description of miracles that happened in the New Testament. And Chloe agrees as well. Yes, to show God's power and authority and to prove his existence is why they occurred in the New Testament, she says. Lou in Minnesota says, yes, uh, in John chapter 7, verse 21, it says, Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you were all amazed. Uh, we know God does not lie and every word in the Bible is the truth, so we can believe it when Jesus said he performed miracles. Their purpose was to prove he is the Son of God, to bring people to faith, to make believers uh, of the people that had witnessed these miracles. I also believe since he loves us, he wanted uh, to help those that asked for it. 
Okay. okay. Thank you, Lou, for that. And Kent says, the miracles that are recorded in the New Testament did indeed take place. The factuality of such is demonstrated by the consistent and credible testimony of the witnesses of such miraculous events. So Kent says, you know, the fact that they all agreed that, such, that something had happened that was miraculous is, is proof. Yeah. yeah. You don't have... You know, there's several places, and I wish I had my, I, I wish I had a note on that, but there are places where Jesus performed miracles, and even his enemies could not deny uh, that miracles occurred. One time was uh, when, when he uh, healed the blind man, uh, uh, see, John, uh, John 12, maybe, see, uh, Okay. Uh, so, so his his detractors admitted that what he had done was a miracle. They couldn't yeah, deny it. Exactly. I'm thinking about Acts chapter four. Yeah, uh, that's another place where the apostles did a miracle, and the, and the detractors could not. The detractors deny it. said, "For indeed, verse 16 of chapter four, for indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it." Yeah. You know, if they could have come out and said, "Hey, hey, no, that's a trick. That's an old trick. They've been doing that for years." I know how they did that. Yeah. I, yeah. I used to pull that trick when I was in high school. Yeah, yeah. No, they couldn't do it. They said we can't deny it, and so. Um, so that's one proof here that uh, Kent says to show that they actually did happen. Uh, Kent says the purpose of miracles was the confirmation of the truth, Mark 16, 15 through 20, which we'll be looking at uh, later on in our study, no doubt. And then Angela says, uh, we know, or say Luke and Paul are the writers in the New Testament who wrote most heavily about miracles. We know that from Luke 1 through 1 through 4, that Luke wrote to instruct not deceive. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 25, Paul points out that by God's mercy he was trustworthy, and we know that God does not lie, Titus 1, verse 2. Therefore, we can know that the things written about miracles are true. The purpose of miracles is to prove the truth of the gospel that the first century Christians were preaching. Thank you, Angela, for that. I'm trying to find... And then uh, Dwight signed in the One chat room, thing here. Go ahead, go and ahead. he says miracles were used to prove the spoken word. Mark 16, verse 20 and Hebrews 20, uh, Hebrews 2, I believe, affirms that. So, uh, yeah, so he says that they did perform miracles, and the miracles were used to affirm the spoken word. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm finding uh, one of the places I was looking for. In uh, John 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, and... Uh, of course, raising someone from the dead, after, and the text will tell us that he'd been dead and in the grave for four days, um, but Jesus raised him from the dead. And But the, the Jesus' enemies were not pleased with that outcome. And it says in John 11, verse uh, 47, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And so... Their, wor their worry was that they were going to lose their power base, uh, uh, but they couldn't deny that he had worked a miracle. John 9 is the man born blind. Born man. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Kyle. Yeah. Kyle's uh, pulling double uh, duty. Too. Yeah, thank you. He's I, making yeah. us look good. And Andy, before thank the you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good, yeah. Kyle. Okay. You. So I think everybody that's co corresponded with us agrees that the miracles of the New Testament, certainly, with well, the miracles of the Bible, there were miracles in the Old Testament as well, but we're concentrating on the miracles in the New Testament especially. They all did occur. They occurred exactly as they're recorded in the Bible, and we all believe that. Now, there are plenty of people in the Bible who don't believe that. And, of course, there's always the, the skeptics, the doubters, the deniers have always had to try to attack the, the miracle accounts in the Bible because they know that that's a key thing. Uh, if the miracles really occurred, then you got a problem. Just like Jesus' enemies, they realized that if, if they didn't do something, that was going to be their undoing because people would believe if the, if, the, if if you couldn't do something, people were going to believe and flock to Jesus. And so the, the deniers and doubters and the enemies have always tried to attack the miracle accounts. And what they've done is to try and suggest that there is a naturalistic explanation to everyone, and there's not. There's not. Yeah, I mentioned earlier the, the walking on water. Uh, uh, Jesus, you know, his disciples were out in the sea, and it was, it was a stormy sea, and it was... In, in the dark of night, and Jesus went out walking on the water, out to them in the ship. 
uh, and uh, and I've I've heard skeptics try to say, well, there's a unique weather phenomenon uh, where sheet ice develops almost instantaneously on a body of water, and, and it just so happened that 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 Jesus played upon that phenomenon. There was sheet ice, and he walked out on the ice, and, and it made it look like he was walking on the water. I don't know about that. I mean, I, I have skated on frozen ponds in the wintertime, and it takes a lot, a lot of cold weather before you can venture out on the ice. Uh, that That's just almost ridiculous. Someone else suggested that Jesus just happened to know where there were some well-placed rocks just below the surface of the water, and he was walking out on rocks. But if you read the account, they, they were way out in the sea, and there were no rocks out there. I mean, the desperate attempts to try and explain away the miracles, just grasping at straws, really. No, the miracles actually happened. They happened just like the Bible records them. Now, the key part of that question is, yeah. what was their purpose? And and uh, and you've already read what some of our uh, uh, responders said. The, the purpose of miracles was to reveal and confirm something from God. And now, when we look at the purpose of miracles, we need to look to the scriptures and see what they state as the purpose of the miracles. Yeah. You know, you know, God performed the miracles for a reason. What was the reason? Well, we need to go to the scriptures and let the scriptures tell us what the reason for the miracles occurring was. Yeah. And Kent, in his email, already already uh, referred to this passage, but let's read it in Mark 16. Uh, Mark 16, verse 15. Jesus said to his apostles, notice verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. So these are the twelve apostles minus Judas. And so he said to them, to the apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now right there is the key expression. They were preaching this new message about a, res a risen Savior. Why should anybody believe what they're saying? This, this would have sounded completely unbelievable to people uh, but when they could perform a miracle people had to take notice of what they were saying and so it was it was confirmation of the message they couldn't they couldn't say hey pull out your bible and look at this and see that what yeah. i'm telling you is the truth they couldn't do that yeah. and by the way if if this so if this is still if miracles are still for today why is it that only a very few people do snake handling? You know, we, we've interviewed a couple of guys, Jacob, yeah, we have. that did snake handling. Uh, and, and almost everybody's, oh, snake handling, that's crazy, that's bizarre, that's way out there, that's, that's nuts. Well, it's not, if, if miracles are still for today, then snake handling's for today too. I mean, why wouldn't, be, why wouldn't we be handling the snakes if miracles are still for today? Because that was the promise. But notice the promise was for a specific purpose to confirm the word that was being revealed and preached in that first century time frame. We're going to see here in a little bit that when that confirmation process had been completed and the miracles were no longer needed, they were taken away. But they, the miracles were for that express purpose. In Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 3, Hebrews 2, verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed, notice, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, but with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So uh, God was uh, bearing witness to those men as they taught the gospel that the message really was from him. So to reveal and confirm God's truth was the purpose of miracles. And, uh, and so certainly, and so to prove that Jesus was who he said he was, because somebody blows into town and says, hey, I'm the Messiah. <laughs> yeah, right. How do we know? Well, he walks on water. We can tell that. He heals the sick. He feeds the 5,000. Uh, 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 there's something special about this guy that just came into town. There may, there's something, there's some credibility Pay to what attention. he's saying. Pay so attention. To prove that Jesus was the Son of God, 
The scriptures teach that. John 12, 20, 30, and 31. To prove that what the apostles were teaching, the disciples were teaching, was truth. Mark 16, verse 20 tells us that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 tell us that that's why they were doing the miracles. So it tells us Jesus did miracles to prove that he was the Son of God so that we can believe. It tells us that they were doing the miracles in the first century to prove that what they were saying from God, the disciples, the apostles were saying was true. Are there any other reasons why they did miracles in the New Testament that the Scriptures tell us about? Well, you know, some people say, well, j- maybe just for the benefit of the people who were the recipients of the, of the, of the miracles. And actually, interestingly, uh, that, the Bible proves otherwise. If, for instance, gifts of healing. People were healed of, of various physical affirmities. Certainly the people who received that miracle were benefited from it. But even in that time frame, not everybody received the miracle. It, was, it, was, it wasn't for the purpose of it. The, the person healed got a secondary benefit, obviously. But the primary purpose of the miracle was to confirm something from God. And I think it's always, it's always been interesting to me in the last letter that Paul wrote, 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, right at the end of the book, he says, Verse 20, 2 Timothy 4, verse 20, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Uh, why did he leave him at Miletum sick? Why didn't he just heal him? I think that, confer- that, that proves to us that the, the gifts, uh, miraculous gifts of healing weren't just so sick people could get well. They, they, they were for the purpose of confirming something. They weren't used for, for just for healing for healing's sake. Yeah, Timothy had often infirmities, Paul yeah. said. Yeah. And uh, why didn't Paul say, hey, just come on see me sometime. We can, fi- we can fix you right up there. There's no reason for you to have to go through all that. Yeah. Hey, come, come see me, man. I'll take care of it. Oh, exactly right. All right. Yeah, in, in, in 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thine often infirmities. Why did Timothy have often infirmities? Why didn't they just heal? Why didn't Paul just I heal mean, him I, with I, it? Timothy was one of Paul. Um, Paul had closest, no one like-minded. Closest like worker. Yeah, his why, closest um, co-worker. And, yeah, he needed Timothy to be well. Why wouldn't yeah. he just heal him and be yeah. over with it? Yeah, yeah. So, so it doesn't appear that it was just, you know, that, like you said, healing for healing's sake. So we're up to break time, but, but, and we're going to have to hurry to get through all this. But notice, we believe the miracles occurred. We got, a, we got a good working definition of miracles. We believe the ones that were recorded in the Scripture definitely occurred. In the New Testament, we know exactly what they were for because the Scripture tells us what the, what the purpose of those miracles was. Uh, not everyone was a miracle worker. It's interesting in Acts chapter, uh, in, in the first chapters of Acts, that only the apostles were working miracles. In fact, you can, you can start in, in Acts chapter 2 where the Holy Ghost came upon the apostles and they were working miracles. Uh, and, and the apostles continued to work miracles. In chapter 5, verse 12, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Uh, but no one else was working miracles until you get clear to chapter 6, where they appointed those seven men to care for needy widows. Among them was Stephen and Philip. And Stephen, in Acts chapter 6, uh, verse 8, was the first one other than an apostle to ever been noted to have worked a miracle. Uh, so it, it, even in the first century time frame, it was, not, it was not universal that every Christian worked miracles. It was, it was unique and specific for the purpose of revealing and confirming God's truth. In the chat room, uh, they were not for personal use. For example, in John 4, when Jesus was thirsty, he didn't speak a, a drink of water into existence to refresh. Why didn't he drink, speak a drink of water into existence to refresh himself? When a miracle was done, there was no doubt amongst those who witnessed it that something supernatural had happened and that those people were witnesses to God's power. Thank you for those comments tonight. And uh, if you haven't sent your comment in yet, get it in now during the break. We'll get this week's bullet point and continue the discussion right after this. Now you can listen to a podcast of a recent sermon every week. Find out more at collegeview.com. There's more of the virtual Bible study right after these important messages. This is Greg Wynn with this week's bullet point. We have an expression about someone who has, quote, a chip on his shoulder, unquote. That expression conjures up an easy mental picture. A fellow places a chip of wood on his shoulder, then he walks around waiting for someone to knock it off. He is spoiling for a fight and ready to react at the slightest provocation. He usually finds his opportunity in short order. 
The chip wearer is quick to take offense. He was just waiting for some petty reason to vent his anger and bitterness, and once he's found it, he will not let it go. His reaction is typically inappropriate and unreasonable. When others appeal to logic, common sense, and rational response, this angry man will not hear it. He is mad, and he intends to stay that way. Dealing with such a person is always a difficult and trying experience. In a workplace, this fellow can sidetrack an entire operation. In a community or neighborhood, he can cause trouble for people far and wide. In a family, you can expect grief at every reunion and gathering. And in the church, he will definitely cause strife, contention, and division. Sadly, these scenarios develop all too often. God's word is plain concerning the man with the chip on his shoulder. Consider it. Ephesians 4, beginning verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Children of God cannot afford to carry a chip on their shoulder. Doing so endangers the soul. That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. My name is Jim Meisner. I worship at the Church of Christ in Deckerville, Michigan. Be sure to listen to the virtual Bible study and watch it. Broadcasting around the world with truths that are out of this world. The Virtual Bible Study. Take it away, guys. Back on the program, as a reminder, this program is brought to you by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. Find out more about us by viewing our website, collegeview.com or thevirtualbiblestudy.com. Or you want to see what a worship service is like here, Kyle can fix you up. That's right. Which, uh, we have, uh, of course, every Sunday morning, we have our uh, Bible class at 9.30 and 10.30 is our, our morning services. And We'll uh, have the stream going, and they'll have the videos up throughout the week, and go back and look at them. So, good. Deal. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think sometimes people are a little bit intimidated to visit a worship service because they don't know. What are those people? Are those people are in there handling, they handling snakes? snakes? Yeah. And so you can watch one of our, uh, or, or you can watch all of our Bible studies and worship services, and there are no snakes present. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. Uh, at least we hope not. They may have gotten in the cracks in the wall, maybe, but no, they shouldn't be here. All right, so we want you to come and uh, and visit with us, but if you'd like to see our services before you do, check out our website, uh, collegeview.com. Okay. All right. Okay, so now what – okay, we want to present did, – did we cover all of our correspondence on, on – I think we did on that second question. Number three, question number three was, has the purpose of miracles been fulfilled? And I, I want to answer that by saying, yes, the purpose of miracles has been fulfilled. First of all, the miracles of Jesus were for the purpose of proving that he was the only begotten Son of God. Um, G, uh, John 20, I think you referenced this earlier, Jacob, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. Notice, many other signs, that's reference to the miracles. These, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Do we need, do we need Jesus to come back and work additional miracles no. so that we can believe that he is the Son of God? Do we need anybody working miracles today to prove that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God? John chapter 20, verse 30 tells me that I've got these they're, these recorded. things are written for that purpose. All right. In verse 30 so, and 31 of John so, chapter 20. So think about it. The miracles of Jesus... Fulfilled their purpose, right? Mm -hmm. We don't need we don't need any miracles today to serve as confirmation, revelation, or confirmation of the identity of Jesus, right? Right. Okay. What about the apostles? We said that the we we already referenced Mark 16, where the Lord worked with them, confirmed the word with signs following. Uh, also, Hebrews chapter two, God bore witness with signs and wonders, with diverse miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost. All right. Now. So we have, our, we have our New Testaments. In the day that these inspired men were doing their work, they needed confirmation. But do I need confirmation today? For instance, do I need to, do I need to work a miracle or does anybody need to work a miracle to confirm that the book of Ephesians is the inspired word of God? Or you get up in the pulpit and tell us that we need to abstain from sexual immorality. I don't believe it. Drink some poison and prove to me that I have that. That's what God wants me to do. I don't have to do that because I can. I can go to the confirmed word, right? Okay. Yeah. Now, if if I if I had miracles, then I could write another book and stick it in the New Testament, and it, and it should deserve to be there just as much as the writings of Paul or Peter or Matthew. Oh. But the fact is, this is a finished work. 
Uh, Second Peter chapter one, verse three, according as his divine power hath given to us, past tense, has already given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So I don't, the, the apostles' work is a finished work. Uh, we have, according to James chapter one, verse, what is it? James chapter one, verse 25, we have the perfect or complete law of liberty. So the apostles certainly are not around working miracles to confirm their work. And and I don't need to do a miracle to confirm their work. Nobody else needs to do a miracle to confirm their work. I got all their the confirmation work, I need Their right work here in my is hands. finished and confirmed. And I can confirm anything you, you say by looking at the scriptures and say, well, is that true or not? Kyle just told me something that sounds pretty far off. Can I, can I look here? Oh, wait, there it is. I guess Kyle was telling the truth. Kyle says, you must be baptized for the remission of sins. Oh, that's not what I thought. But Kyle turns me to Acts 2.38, Mark 16.16. 16. And sure enough, there it is. It Kyle's does telling the truth. Yeah. He doesn't have to work a miracle to prove to me that it is the truth. He can show me from the confirmed word. Yeah. Uh, so, so you're looking at the purpose of miracles, and now you're saying, well, I don't, need, I don't need Jesus confirmed. I don't need the word confirmed anymore. What were the other purposes yeah. of miracles? I, I've, I've, I'm sure I've used this illustration on the virtual Bible study before. I know I've used it lots of times in teaching and preaching. I think a really good mental picture of miracles is is this picture. When when you're building a building, especially a large building, you you erect scaffolding around a building uh, in order that you can get up on the scaffolding and do the work of constructing the building. But when the work is done, you come down and you take the scaffolding down. As you come down, you take it away. It's not needed anymore. It was essential in the building process of the, of the building, but once the building is finished the scaffolding comes down. And I think that's a really good sort of analogy of, of miracles. They were necessary in the early church because Jesus' identity needed to be revealed and confirmed. The apostles' doctrine needed to be revealed and confirmed. But when, when that had been accomplished, take the scaffolds down. The miracles oh, aren't yeah. needed anymore. The work, is, the, the work that it, the miracles were intended to do has been completed. All right. 877-381-4567. Questions at collegeu.com. So, you ask the question, uh, has the purpose of miracles been fulfilled? To that question, Chloe answered emphatically, yes. Uh, Lou in Minnesota says, uh, he says, I believe the purpose of miracles is being fulfilled. Not, not that it has, but it is still being fulfilled. He says they are happening today as they always were and for the same reasons. Number one, to bring people to faith or to strengthen, strengthen their existing faith so that they can testify to others, and also because God loves us. All right, I've got to respectfully disagree with Lou. Uh, that's not how we get faith. They're happening today as they always were for the same reasons, to bring people to faith. That's not what the, that's not what the Bible says. Romans ten seventeen says, Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If miracles are to produce faith in unbelievers today, why, why then should we even preach the gospel? Why isn't God working miracles and convincing everybody to believe? Why are there places in the world where there are no believers? Uh, if God wants all to be saved, and we know that he does, and if miracles are to produce faith in unbelievers, why isn't, why isn't God working miracles all over the world to bring people to faith? Because that's not how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And, and reference again the passage that we read in John chapter 20. The, the signs that Jesus did are written down for us that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so miracles today, are they're not needed. The purpose has been fulfilled. And that's not how we come to faith today, by witnessing a miracle. Um, also, on the idea of strengthening, strengthening existing faith, I'm reminded of Acts chapter 20, verse 32, as Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, he says, no, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So our faith is strengthened by God's word, um, which has been verified and proven by miracles, but but now we have the word, the verified word, 
that is uh, performing or that is to to be used to strengthen our faith. And then also the idea that that God loves us. Well, you mentioned uh, Erasmus in uh, in Second uh, Timothy chapter four verse twenty. Did 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 God not love him because Trophimus? Trophimus, yes, Trophimus. Tro- and first in Second Timothy four, yeah, yeah. Second Timothy four and was it verse twenty? I think it's twenty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Erastus. Or, no, it was Erastus. Or, Erastus abode at Corinth. But Trophimus no, 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 have I left at my lead him sick. Yeah. So Trophimus, did God not love Trophimus? Or Trophimus about, was a good man. He's commended elsewhere. What about someone else who might be sick, really sick, and in a lot of pain and, and, and agony? If they're not healed, does not God not love them? What about people dying every day? G- good, faithful Christians are dying every day. Why aren't they healed? Does God not love them? And, you know, and the idea of strengthening faith, I, I think you were, were with me that time that uh, we were talking to a lady, and uh, she was, her faith was completely shaken because she had been told she had some type of physical ailment, that God loves you, and that he wants you to be healed, and he will heal you. You just need to pray, and God will heal you. Well, she said, I've prayed, and I believe in miracles, but God hasn't healed me yet. And so now... Not, my faith's not been strengthened. In fact, she said, I even wonder if there's a God because yeah. I still have this, whatever it was, yeah. Yeah. and God hasn't healed me. Yeah. So that's the problem you get into with saying that miracles still occur today so that you can be strengthened or your faith can be strengthened, and because God loves and wants the best for you, well, that doesn't happen yeah, you're, to you're, everybody or yeah. to people. So, and so it, it, it's an inconsistent if it, 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 application it, it, that leaves people in complete it, doubt. It's problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, it's okay. Real quickly, Angela says, yes, the purpose of miracles has been fulfilled. We have many accounts of the miracles performed back in the New Testament times, which can help us believe, as did those in the first century. The Christians then were convinced. Their children were convinced. And so were children and so on and so on. Christianity is the most solid and unchanging religion in the world, despite being the most challenged, as they say, there it stands. Hey, thank you, uh, Angela. And then uh, Kent says, the purpose of miracles has been fulfilled. Such is successfully argued and proven in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. A contrast is drawn between agape love and miraculous gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. Prophecies were to come to an end. Miraculous speaking in unlearned languages would cease. Miraculous knowledge would vanish away. Limitations were placed upon these concepts because of their incomplete and temporal nature. When that which was total would come about, that which was in part would be done away. Partial revelation brought about only partial knowledge. Complete revelation brought about complete knowledge. The miraculous gifts of the first century were provisional, bringing about partial knowledge and confirmation of the truth. They were therefore temporary. When the Word of God was brought to total completion, the provisional and temporary gifts were done away. Okay. That's what Ken says. All right. We want to deal a little bit more, especially with that 1 Corinthians 13 passage in just a minute. Let's grab our last break. When we come back, we'll race to the top of the hour. All right. Uh, next question. The, well, uh, we, wanted, we want to talk about how did people receive the miraculous gifts and were they predicted to end? Okay. Well, that, that helps answer the question as well today. If we see how they got the miraculous gifts in the first century. Yeah then we can determine if they still exist today. And uh, if the Bible says they were going to end or talks about a time when they went in, then we can know that as well. So we'll take that to the top of the hour. Don't go anywhere. We're back right after this. These guys are doing all of the talking. We need to hear from you. Call in now. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. Hi, I'm Wade Shelton. In 1 Peter 3.15, the scripture says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, we believe here at College View that we should be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks it. And I believe that we are dedicated to this cause. That's why we here at College View bring you the virtual Bible study each week. Our hope is that you will join us each week here on the virtual Bible study in hopes of strengthening your faith so that you will be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Please join us here every Thursday night on the virtual Bible study. I know that it's worth an hour of your time. We're tracking the trends on the virtual Bible study. A recent survey shows that only 5% of the United States population gives as much as 10% of their annual income to a church or nonprofit organization. 
In fact, most self-identified Christians today give an average of 2.5% of their salary to a church or to a nonprofit. That amount is significantly down from a 3.3% average that was given by Christians during the Great Depression. That information is via the Barna Group. The Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Missed a recent virtual Bible study program? Listen to any of our past programs from the archive section of our website. Now, back to the virtual Bible study. Okay, we're going to the top of the hour, and uh, we're glad that you're listening to us tonight as we talk about miracles and the purpose of them today. All right. We're going to suggest in general three, three arguments that indicate that the men, the men do not today have the power to work miraculous gifts by the Holy Spirit. We've dealt rather thoroughly with the point that they're, they're not needed any longer. So the purpose has been fulfilled, argument one. A second argument is how did men receive <coughs> these miraculous gifts? And there were two means by which they were received. One was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> We see a case of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. We're going to have to go quickly here, and we could spend a lot more time talking about this. But in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus had promised them that they would be. In Acts chapter 1, <coughs> he told them to tarry in Jerusalem. He said, tarry in Jerusalem uh, because you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Acts 1 verse 5. So Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost is when that actually happened, and they, they, they immediately began to perform miracles, <coughs> including specifically speaking in tongues as one of the signs of, 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 of the miraculous. But think about that case. They were speaking in tongues. Read Acts 2. What it did, it was convince the people who were there that these men must be speaking the word of God in order, in order to have this special ability. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit was one way in which the gifts of the Spirit were manifested, but that was a very rare thing. It was, it was promised exclusively to the apostles, and it happened one other time in Acts chapter 10 when Peter received a vision. He went to the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. For the very first time, the gospel was preached to a Gentile, and a Gentile and his household believed and obeyed, but the gent uh, on that Gentile household, the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred as well, just like it had occurred on the apostles. And Peter said uh, in Acts chapter 11, when he was retelling the, the event, Acts chapter 11, verse 16, I remembered the uh, 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 verse 15, he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as, as it has been falling on everybody. No. The Holy Ghost fell on them as it did on us at the beginning. Peter only, only had one other thing that he could remember to compare it to. What happened to Cornelius in Acts 10 was what happened to, to the apostles in Acts 2. It was not happening all the time. Now, you mentioned it, that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's not the gift of the Holy Spirit that is promised in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts 2, 38, I think the gift of the Holy Spirit, there's some different people have different ideas, but I, I think very strongly that the gift of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2, 38 is the gift of salvation. The, the Holy Spirit gives. Through the work of the Spirit, we are granted the gift of salvation. Yeah, so you, you shall receive, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call. But So that's a, a universal promise, this gift of the Holy Spirit. But it is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit that yeah. you referenced there, those two occurrences. Yeah, and by the time Paul wrote Ephesians, which we think was mid-60s, in the mid-60s, Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, and he said there's, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 4, there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called one hope, you're calling one Lord, one faith, one one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. If you want to know what the one baptism that remained in the mid-60s, it wasn't Holy Spirit baptism. Holy Spirit baptism had already ended in the mid-60s. The one baptism that was remained was water baptism for the remission of sins. In chapter 5 of Ephesians, Paul specifically mentions verse 26, the washing of water by the word. Water baptism for the remission of sins still remained Holy Spirit baptism was gone. There was only one baptism in the mid-60s when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. So people got miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit by Holy Spirit baptism. 
the apostles did. The only other case of it is the case of Cornelius. The only other recorded case of Holy Spirit baptism is the case of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. But we know, so Holy Spirit baptism is not happening today. And it happened to a limited number of people. It only ever happened to a limited a number. A dozen, of maybe. I mean, a couple dozen, maybe. The yeah. apostles and whoever. Was Cornelius's there household. Okay. Uh, I think we, we would include the apostle Paul in that number too, likely. But we don't have. We only have a record of when he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. It, so, that wasn't the only way people received gifts. Another way they received gift is when the apostles laid their hands on someone. They could pass this gift on by lay, physically laying their hands on people. They could pass these gifts on. Uh, and really, we, we're going to really be short on time, but a perfect example of how that happened was, is in Acts 8. We know in Acts chapter 6 that Philip was one of the ones who had the apostles, uh, they laid their hands on seven men, and among them were Stephen and Philip, Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Philip went to Samaria in Acts chapter 8, and he, he did miracles because the apostles had laid hands on him. He was able to work miracles, but he couldn't pass it on, and it required in Acts chapter uh, 8, verse 15, beginning, it required the apostles to come down from Jerusalem, and they laid hands on people. Philip couldn't do it. In other words, it was a one generation pass. The apostles could give it to, to somebody, but that somebody couldn't pass it on. Uh, and Acts 8 shows that. So the apostles are long since dead. They're not around to lay hands on anybody. So no Holy Spirit baptism, no apostles to lay on hands. You can't get the you can't get the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit today. Now again, those are the only two ways we see it occurring in the New Testament where someone could get the gift of being able to work miracles. And so you're saying that the ability to perform them today is ended. We're going we're running out of time. Why don't we quickly go on to your last uh, the, the, the last point. So uh, purpose fulfilled, means of receiving not available to us any longer today. The third way that we know miracles have ended is because the scriptures actually say that we're going to end and tell us when. And the key passage is the one that Kent mentioned in his email in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, first, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 13 beginning verse 8. 1 Corinthians 13 beginning verse 8. It speaks of, in verse 8 it says, uh, whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Whether, uh, um, prophecies, they shall fail. So he, he mentions prophecies, tongue speaking, and knowledge, which, by the way, was divinely inspired knowledge. He says they're all going to pass away. And he tells us when. He says we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that was which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. They had partial knowledge, but when full knowledge was received, when, when the revelation was complete, uh, the, the, the partial things would be done away. The gifts would end. That's a, there's a lot more to say about 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13, but that is the key text that says miracles were going to end and when they were going to end. They were going to end when God's revelation was completed. Eight seven seven three eight one four five six seven is the number to yeah you, know, you might call after the program. We over. don't have time for a call yeah. now, but we got real quickly we have uh, some, some emails here. So, yeah. So um, all right. So uh, Donna, just in summary, says the Bible tells us about mir these miracles to give the reader hope, encourage our faith, and to show God's love for us. So she says we can read about the miracles for those purposes. Okay. Uh, Chloe says the people received miraculous gifts by the apostles, Acts eight seventeen and eighteen, and the apostles received it from God, Acts fifteen verse two nineteen eleven and four. 7 through 10. And she says, yes, they, they were predicted to end and gives that 1 Corinthians 13, 8 passage. All right. And Lou says, how do people receive miraculous gifts in the first century? Are those means still available to us today? He says, through baptism, they receive the Holy Spirit, a spirit of power, love, and sound mind, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. And with him, they received one or more of his gifts, words of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gift of healing, Mir uh, working in miracles, prophecy, discerning spirits, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of tongues, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 and through 10. Uh, Lou goes on, he says, Today we still have baptism to receive the Holy Spirit, so yes, those gifts are available to us. We may not receive every gift of the Holy Spirit, but we all have at least one, Romans 12, verses 4 through 8. That's, uh, again, I have to respectfully disagree with Lou. Lou, look in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, beginning verse 29, 
Paul asks, and these are rhetorical questions, the answer to each one is no. Uh, I think it's clear from the context. So, so look at this. So uh, a little bit farther on there in Romans, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, from verses 8 through 10 that he referenced. You're down yeah, at verse yeah. 20, 29. 29. Are all apostles? Answer, no. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? And so even in the first century, when some did have miracle working powers, Paul said not everybody did. Not all were workers of miracles, even in the first century. Okay. All right. Good. Um, and, uh, okay, let's get on to uh, Kent. Kent says... The apostles of Christ received miraculous gifts and the ability to confer such as by Holy Spirit baptism, Acts 1, 8, 8, uh, Acts 8, 11 through 4, or 14 through 17, Romans 1, verse 11. Christians in the first century received miraculous gifts from the laying on of the apostles' hands, Acts 8, 14 through 17, Romans 1, verse 17. Uh, those means are no longer available to individuals today. Holy Spirit baptism is no longer extant. He references Ephesians 4, verse 5, as you reference, so that Holy Spirit baptism is not uh, currently in place today. The only type of baptism that those in Ephesus received was that of water baptism, Acts 19, 1 through 6. We do not have living apostles today to confer such gifts. In addition to that, we have a complete revelation in the Word of God, and the need for miraculous gifts has ceased. And then quickly, Angela says, uh, in the first century, mirac miracles were bestowed by the laying on of the apostles' hands, Acts 8, 18, 19, verse 6, Romans 1, 11, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. Paul's speaking there, she says. The apostles have all passed away now, so we can no longer receive gifts by the laying on of their hands. There are religious groups out there that believe that apostles are still around or that the apostolic position can be passed down through the generations. But in Acts 1, verses 20 through 22, when the apostles needed to replace Judas after his death, they chose another man to take his place. And we see that there were our specific qualifications to become an apostle. And later when Paul becomes an elder, we see that he meets those qualifications too. Paul, if, you mean Peter, is... is Paul wasn't an elder. No, okay. When, when he became an apostle, I'm sorry. Apostle, Paul, yeah. he met those qualifications because he'd been with Christ, yeah. or he'd seen Christ. Yeah. Uh, if these qualifications aren't met, then there can be no apostles today. Right. Yeah. Real quickly, uh, Lou asked in the, uh, Lou, who, who wrote us an email, also asked in the chat room, doesn't 1 Corinthians 13, 8 refer to the second coming of Christ? When he comes again, these gifts shall end. Actually, no, Lou. Look at that carefully. Uh, it speaks of prophecies are going to fail, tongues will cease, knowledge will vanish away. Notice, but now get the context. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, we have something partial. But when that which is perfect is come, the perfect is the complete. The word perfect there means complete. So they had, what did they have? They had partial knowledge because this process of revelation was underway. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The, the miracles were for the for the age of infancy in the church when they had only partial knowledge. When the complete knowledge, so the perfect there in verse 10 is that is the complete of that which they had partially in verse 9. They knew in part, they prophesied in part, but when the complete is come or the perfect is come, then the partial things will be done away. Well, when the, when the revelation of God was completed, the partial gifts we were taken need, away. They don't need partial miraculous knowledge anymore. They have complete knowledge in God's Word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what Jared in the chat room just said. He said the, the perfect in part in 1 Corinthians 13 must refer to the same thing. Exactly. The other, the other way that we can verify that what you said is true is verse 13 of chapter 13. Now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. What's going to remain after those yeah. miraculous gifts are gone. What's well, going to remain? Well, well, think about this. If if the perfect coming is Jesus, if, if if when the perfect has come, the partial will be done away as a reference to the coming of Jesus, then, as you said, Jacob, the last verse doesn't make sense. Uh, these it now abideth faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest thing is charity. If the perfect coming is Jesus, we won't have faith when Jesus has come. We'll have sight we won't have hope when Jesus comes. We'll have realization of the hope. You will have love. You still have love, but the, that's why it's the, the greatest. But the fact that that faith and uh, hope still abide indicates that he's not talking about the coming of Jesus. Right. Right. 
Okay. We're out of time. Way out of time. We're out of time. Uh, Oh, we're way over. Oh, man, we're over. Uh, Well, we can talk about this some more, and we probably will need to talk about this some more, and maybe we'll have another program to discuss it. Uh, But, again, if you disagree, we want to hear from you, and we want to hear your point of view uh, and so we can study these things together and come to a better understanding. Uh, final thoughts, Dad? No, I think it's an important study. We, we rushed through it somewhat, but it's really an important study. Kyle, anything from your side of the board tonight? It was a good study. I think it's a very important study, so it's good. Thank you for being here tonight, Kyle. Dad, thank you for your time. Thanks, Jake. Thanks to all our listeners for your participation, and uh, we hope you benefit from our study and discussion of God's Word. We hope we make plans to be back here this time next week for another edition of the Virtual Bible Study. In the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired Word of the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.